I rise to address matters pertaining to security uh, arising from the gracious speech. Uh, my uh, my hon. Friend will address health matters uh, later. Uh, as I do so, uh, I speak to the SNP's amendment, which urges the Government to exempt Police Scotland and Scottish Fire and Rescue from VAT without yeah, further yeah, delay. Yeah, yeah. I wish also to indicate that the Scottish National Party will support uh, the Labour Party amendment. Uh, the SNP have, uh, SNP have consistently opposed the party opposite's austerity agenda, and the manifesto on which we won the general election in Scotland indicated that in these times the pay cap is no longer sustainable and they would be looking at it very closely. So I'm very happy to lend our support uh, to uh, my hon. Friend, the Shadow Home Secretary, on this matter. On the matter of police and fire service cuts, I'm very happy to say that the Scottish Government has not imposed the sort of cuts that have been seen south of the border, and I'll come to that. Uh, later. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to look in particular at the proposals for a counter-extremism commission, the proposals to review whether the police and security services have all the powers that they need, and concerns which I and my party hold about the scope of the repeal bill, particularly for justice and home affairs issues. I also want to address the potential impact of Brexit on our security arrangements. The European Union enables European nations to come together not just for the common economic and social good, but also for us to tackle crime and terrorism in the interests of all citizens across Europe. And last year, Rob Wainwright, the current British director of Europol, said that, the, that in the event of Britain leaving the European Union, security <coughs> pacts, in, in the event of Britain leaving the, the European Union, it would be very difficult to negotiate security pacts from outside the bloc of Europol and he said that trying to do so would be a damage limitation exercise. Yeah, right. Now, we have yet to hear any detail about how the Government proposes to address this problem. We need to look at it closely. The Scottish National Party has already <coughs> welcomed the Prime Minister's recent change in tone and rhetoric following the attack at Finsbury Park. We were very pleased to hear the Prime Minister equate all forms of extremism. And we hope that that signals the beginning of an approach by the government that will not single out any particular group in our community for counter extremism or terrorism measures. Because we believe, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that measures to counter extremism are very important, but they must not be allowed to create division amongst our many diverse com communities across the United Kingdom. We continue to be very concerned that despite the government's failed attempts to introduce a counter-extremism bill in the last parliament, they have yet to offer any legal, legally sustainable definition of extremism or British values. We are concerned, as I have said previously, that the new plan in the gracious speech to establish a commission to look at these matters risks bypassing parliamentary scrutiny and the need for legal certainty on these very nebulous terms of extremism and British values. So I was pleased to hear the Home Secretary say in response to a question from me last week that any recommendations the Commission brings forward will be fully scrutinised uh, by this Parliament. Mr Deputy Speaker, we've already heard about the Prevent strategy, which has been controversial and concerns have repeatedly been raised about its implementation. Can I respectfully suggest that the UK Government look at how we have implemented the Prevent strategy in Scotland as a model of how things might be improved. Because although counter-terrorism is of course a reserved issue, the implementation of policies to counter-extremism is the responsibility of the devolved uh, institutions. And in Scotland we have worked very hard to recognise that we have diverse communities and that they must all be allies in ensuring that all our citizens are safe. And the Prevent delivery in Scotland has benefited from positive relationships fostered with all communities in Scotland through years of regular engagement. And we recognise that the way in which people are becoming radicalised is constantly evolving and changing, and therefore we must remain vigilant and refresh our approach accordingly, but continue to work with our communities rather than against them in making sure that terrorist messages eh, won't resonate. Can I turn now to the question of whether the police and security services have all the powers that they need. We in the SNP believe that they do have sufficient powers at their disposal and that the real issue the Government should be looking at 
is whether the police and security services have sufficient resources to fight terrorism. And I'm fortified in that view uh, by the quote from Max Hill QC, the official reviewer of terrorism, which has already been referred to uh, today, when he said, my view coming into the scrutiny, which we are told the Prime Minister wants to conduct, is that we do have the appropriate laws in place and that essentially the police and security services and those whose job it is to keep us safe do have the powers at their disposal. Mr Deputy Speaker, are police and security services already, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's already a crime to incite violence. People suspected of terrorist activity can already be stopped and searched and people who aid terrorists are already imprisoned and those who are convicted of plotting an attack can be locked up for life. So we have the powers. During the passage of the Investigatory Power Bill in the last Parliament, the Scottish National Party repeatedly urged that what the government should be doing is concentrating its resources on robust, targeted surveillance of suspects, rather than subjecting the whole population to blanket, suspicionless surveillance. Yeah, yeah. During the election campaign, and after the terrible terrorist atrocities in Manchester and London, the Prime Minister rightly faced very difficult questions about the resources she's putting into targeted surveillance. The Prime Minister was Home Secretary for seven years, and it's clear her influence still holds sway at the Home Office, for example, in relation to the unrealistic and unobtainable immigration targets which are continuing to be set. Therefore, the Prime Minister must face up to her responsibility for cuts to police budgets and police numbers in England, which have been dictated by her party's narrow austerity agenda. And that's why I'm happy for the SNP to lend support uh, to Labour's amendment. <coughs> it doesn't have to be this way, Mr Deputy Speaker. In Scotland, the Scottish Government have increased police numbers, and in particular, we've invested in increasing the number of trained police armed responders while still balancing our budget. And, Mr Speaker, we've been able to do that despite the UK Government's repeated refu refusal to remove the burden of VAT from Police Scotland. Police Scotland is the only territorial police authority in the United Kingdom unable to recover VAT. I and my Scottish Government colleagues have repeatedly raised this issue with the UK Government. I wrote to the Minister about the issue earlier uh, this year. The SNP have tabled an amendment to the gracious speech <coughs> calling on the Government to rectify this anomaly, and we call on them again to do that today. <coughs> We've recently yeah, rectified yeah. the anomaly for a number of other national bodies. Mm. Now it's time to do it for Police Scotland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But notwithstanding the Tory government's failure to rectify that anomaly, the contrast between Scotland and the United Kingdom in policing terms couldn't be starker. 20,000 police officers have been lost in England, but in Scotland we've maintained 1,000 more than the number we inherited when the SNP first came into government in 2007. And we've also taken steps to increase the number of police officers who are trained to carry firearms. In the days following the Manchester attack, Police Scotland were able to provide the heightened level of police cover, including armed policing, without having to call on the resources of a, the military. We've also protected the police resource budget in Scotland, whereas since 2011 in England, the Home Office has cut the amount it's spent on policing by 20 per cent. So it's time for the party opposite to stop diverting attention from their under-resourcing of police and emergency services and to follow the Scottish Government's lead in giving the police and emergency services the resources they need. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, I've already said that international cooperation is essential to keep Scotland and the rest of the UK safe from the threats of, of organised crime, cybercrime and terrorism. And in this Parliament, SNP MPs will call for continued cooperation across Europe, and we will oppose any moves that would seek to use security cooperation as a bargaining chip in Brexit or trade negotiations with our European friends and neighbours. It's simply uh, too important for that. The gracious speech promised a new law in concerning protection of personal data, but we won't be able to continue to cooperate with our EU colleagues unless we abide by EU data protection and privacy protection law. And in practice, there will be limits to how closely the UK and the EU27 can work together if we in the United Kingdom are no longer accountable or subject to the oversight and adjudication of supranational institutions, such as, most importantly, the European Court of Justice, 
We saw at the end of last year the European Court of Justice took a rather dim view of the provisions for data collection and retention which are now in the Investigatory Powers Act, as many of us, including myself, had warned would occur when the bill was going through the House. If the UK does not comply with EU law on data sharing and privacy protection, our former partners will not, able, will not be able to share information with us under the laws by which they are bound. Now, that would be a disaster for security cooperation. It would also be a disaster for business and the universities and uh, research. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am a little concerned that the gracious speech does not mention any specific pieces of legislation in relation to many of these matters pertaining to justice and home affairs. And at the same time, the government has confirmed that the repeal bill is going to include powers to allow for changes resulting from the negotiations to leave the EU. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is vital that ministers and civil servants are not handed vast powers to change our legal landscape without, par without proper parliamentary scrutiny, particularly in relation uh, to security matters. And it's also vital that in relation to justice and home affairs matters, legislative consent motions are sought. And I'm delighted that the Prime Minister, the Secretary of State for Exiting the EU and the Secretary of State for Scotland have now all indicated that legislative consent will be sought to the repeal bill. Finally, I want to turn very briefly to the issue of human rights protections. During the election campaign, the Prime Minister spoke about ripping up human rights to fight terrorism. I very much suspect that this attack on human rights was an attempt to distract <coughs> from her own security failings and the impact of policing cuts in England. So I renew my request to the Home Secretary to confirm that there is absolutely nothing in the Human Rights Act or the European Convention of Human Rights that would prevent a robust approach to terrorism. And therefore, will she please today confirm that there are no plans to tear up human rights to tackle terrorism? I would remind her that the UNHCR have said, and I quote, effective counter-terrorism measures and the protection of human rights are complementary and mutually reinforcing objectives which must be pursued together as part of the state's duty to protect individuals within their jurisdiction. Terrorism is a fundamental attack on our way of life, and of course we must respond robustly and appropriately, but it's at times like this that human rights must be protected and cherished and not attacked and undermined. In the announcement by the Crown Prosecution Service today in relation to Hillsborough, we have seen the prospect of justice being finally brought about after many, many years as a result of the Human Rights Act guaranteeing a proper inquiry into the Hillsborough disaster. If we rip up human rights in this country, we undermine the traditions that we all stand for and should share across this House, and we play into the terrorist plans to undermine our democracy and the rule of law. I would like to echo what the Honourable Member for Totnes said in highlighting that across all four NHS services, the biggest challenge is facing increased demand from an ageing population with huge and growing workforce challenges. These are being aggravated by Brexit. We see a 95% drop in nursing applications from the EU, but also the prolonged 1% pay cap. Members rightly paid tribute to emergency services after the terrorist attacks and the appalling Grenfell fire. It is now time that we met the rhetoric with a decent salary. Now, it seemed a bit strange to me to combine a debate on security and a debate on health, but when I made my maiden speech two years ago in the Queen's speech, I did highlight to the government that its first priority is the security of its citizens, not from the point of view of replacing weapons of mass destruction, but the security that comes from knowing that you have a roof over your head and food on the table. But it also matters what kind of roof. The people of Grenfell were failed. They were failed by local government scrimping and saving on cladding and sprinklers and successive UK governments who did not act on previous warnings. The first issue raised about cladding and sprinkling was due to a fatal fire in my constituency in 1999 when a disabled man lost his life. That's 18 years ago. I give way to the Honourable Lady. Well, he's giving way, but would she not agree with me? It's absolutely imperative in the wake of this terrible tragedy that we wait and establish the facts. But well, one of the facts we do know is that local authority had almost a quarter of a, of a billion pounds in reserves. So there's, an in, there's a good implication there that it wasn't about scrimping and scraping. 
may well be there have been other serious failures, but we await that full public inquiry and we then establish all the facts. I would reply to the Honourable Lady saying I'm not talking they were scrimping and saving because they didn't have money, but they weren't spending the money. They used cheap panels and they didn't put in they didn't put in sprinklers. We have six hundred plus buildings across London and England that are covered in these panels that clearly contain flammable materials. They do not have we hear from Camden missing fire doors despite spending millions. So there's been a focus, as Ben Oakley says in his poem, on surface, on appearance, and not on the substance of the building and protecting the people who live in it. I'm very grateful to the Honourable I always listen to her remarks with a great deal of care and respect. But can I appeal to her to look at the evidence base before making the sort of remarks she has? Because words are important, and we have established an inquiry which will establish the facts and make recommendations. Until then, I think her remarks are premature with the greatest of respect. The Honourable Gentleman may feel the remarks are premature with regard Grenfell, but they're not premature regard Lacanal, regard Irvine and regarding other tower block fires that were clearly shown to be related to cladding and where sprinklers could have made a difference. So we have been warned repeatedly over these 18 years and we have not taken action. The people in Grenfell didn't just die because of fire regulations, they also died because of inequality. They lived in the richest borough in the richest city, but yet they contained among the most poor and vulnerable. That tower stands like a black monolith shadowing the whole city and this place. But the people that were in it were not well served. We see people dying in Grenfell in drama, horror. And, and, pardon me, suddenly. But yet people die of inequality, poverty and deprivation all the time. We see a 20-year gap in longevity between the richest and poorest, both in their life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. 1,400 children under 15 die every year as a direct result of poverty. That's like the roof of a secondary school collapsing on them every year. Surely, if that was happening, we would be taking action. For the last time... Well, I, I, I again, I echo the comments of my honourable friend here. There's a lot of respect for most of what the honourable lady says, but would she agree with me that no one side in this place has a, has a, a hold on the moral things that guide us. All of us come into this place to make life better for all our constituents and the eradication of poverty runs deep into the root of conservatism as elsewhere in this house. If the lady lady had listened to what I was saying, she would have heard I said UK governments. I talked about 18 years. That is not one government. That is repeated governments who have been complacent and who have not taken action. The children who are dying because they are born into poverty, they die of low birth weight, they die of chronic illness, they die of suicide, of road traffic accidents, and poignantly, they die of house fires. The children who live in poverty suffer from hunger, malnutrition, cold and damp houses, chronic illness. They lose their chance to succeed at school. They lose the life opportunities a lot of us take for granted. Child poverty is now approaching 4 million and expected to reach 5 million by the end of this decade. That is an indictment on everyone in this House. An average of 28% of the British UK population of children live in poverty. But that's an average that hides the inequality across the UK. There are wards in the north of England where actually it reaches the high 40s. That's nearly half of the children in that area growing up in poverty. These children will not have decent life chances. And if we think that that saves money, we are wrong, because we will be picking up the pieces later in their lives when they end up with addiction or in the criminal justice syndrome. So we need to tackle this now. The biggest driver of ill health is poverty. And the biggest driver of poverty are the decisions we make. We've had two cuts 
to welfare acts in 2012 and 2015, and that is when child poverty stopped falling and started rising. We need to change this. We have a responsibility, as the Prime Minister keeps saying, to every single person across this country, and that includes the children of this country. According to uh, Madam Speaker, it's great to see you there. Um, is, I just wonder if the right honourable member is aware of the news that was released by the ONS today that of the 28 countries in the EU, the UK has got the fifth lowest rate of child poverty. There's more to be done, but surely that's a very good start. Well, I think, that's, I think that may come down to a matter of definition. In this House, last year, we had a government that was trying to get rid of child poverty by simply putting a pen through it and removing the title from the Commission for Social Mobility and Child Poverty, and also wanted to abandon the Child Poverty Act and the commitment to end child poverty, and also to stop measuring income. Because, oh, let's face it, the money you have in your family, that has no contribution to poverty. I'm running out of time. I really can't. I'm sorry. So, to wind up, we all have a responsibility to the children across the United Kingdom to invest in their future and not to allow them to be cast aside because we will pay the price later. This needs to change now. That's how you change health, and that's how you protect NHS services in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Marks will be primarily focused on defence and international security, and I think I must not be the only member of the House that was somewhat dismayed by the fact that defence got so little attention during the election campaign, which perhaps explains why defence has been given such a poor showing in the Queen's speech, adumbrated by the fact that not a single defence minister has appeared at that dispatch box in five days of a Queen's speech. That said, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to start on a note of consensus. <laughs> the Bill on Flexible Working for the Armed Forces is somewhere that I think we can work with the Government on. Now, there is much to be welcomed in the fact that the Government is now looking at this seriously, as it is a model that works elsewhere in the world. Our manifesto committed to making the case for having an armed forces representative body on a statutory footing, again something that is the norm in countries like Germany, the Netherlands and Denmark. Mr Deputy Speaker, our serving personnel should be properly represented within the military and with defence policy decision makers, and we look forward to making that case here in Parliament. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd also like to express our continued frustration at the lack of a national shipbuilding strategy. In the last Parliament, the Government continued to move the goalposts and avoided being upfront with the country on what was happening here. Despite continuous attempts by honourable members on both sides of the House, the Government continued to duck and dive. Well, the time for ducking and diving on the national shipbuilding strategy is over. Here, here. If it's not written, then get it written. If it is written, then the government needs to get it published. But more here, fundamental, here. Mr Deputy Speaker, was the grave omission from the Queen's speech on a new SDSR. The previous SDSR was based on the premise that Britain would still be a member of the European Union. Now, given that it has not taken Brexit into account, its risk analysis and ultimately its conclusions surely require updating with some considerable urgency. Mr Deputy Speaker, we will also hold the Government to account on its actions abroad. On Monday of this week, the Defence Secretary gave a very helpful briefing on the current situation in Syria, which I thank him for, but we do remain concerned about the deconfliction lines between Russia and coalition forces. We would also like to hear a bit more about what the Government is doing to tackle <coughs> the poison of Daesh online. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is something more profound that we would like to see change, and that is the defence posture of the United Kingdom government. We would like to see not only a shift away from the militaristic projection around the world, which relies on trident, but we would like to see a shift towards defending our own waters and those in the Atlantic Gap and the High North. This is a massive dereliction of duty on the government's part in keeping its citizens safe, and it is also a dereliction to what we owe our 
allies. It was the former US general and NATO saccur Philip Breedlove who described the North Atlantic as NATO's lifeblood and the transatlantic link. So I plead with the government to please face up to its responsibilities in the High North. I don't have time to cover everything, but however long we're here for, Mr Speaker, I'll be sure to get round to it. Mr Speaker, it was ten past eight in the evening on Friday the 19th of May when I realised that the election campaign was going to get a whole lot more interesting than I thought it was when it was called. I was sitting in a room in a public school outside Guildford taking part in the BBC Radio 4 uh, Any Questions programme. And the first question from the audience was, was the government taking the support of pensioners for granted with the pronouncements it had made a few days earlier with regard to the funding of pensions and social care? Now, listeners to the radio won't have heard this, of course, but I could tell in that room that the audience didn't need to wait for the panel to pronounce before they made up their mind to that question. The sense of indignation and outrage was palpable. And in that moment, I knew that if that was the feeling of these small-c Conservative voters in the heart of Tory Surrey, then the electorate were most certainly on manoeuvres in this election and that the outcome was going to be a lot more unpredictable than any of us had imagined. Now, of course, the policy that of making people pay to their social care to the point of their own impoverishment was quickly qualified and taken off the table. But as we all know in politics, perception is everything and the damage was done. And I believe that one of the reasons why a government with a majority went into an election and lost it is because of that ill-fated policy. Now, we are promised in the gracious speech that there will be a review of social care and presumably the funding of social care. So what concerns me is that the thinking behind that ill-fated policy is still alive and well on the benches opposite and that it may yet come forward as ruminations continue on public policy in this area. So I want to spend this brief time just to dismiss that thinking and to say it should not form part of our thinking. Because, Mr Speaker, there is a perfectly legitimate point of view on the political right that says that the funding of public services in this country should be transferred from the state to the individual. It's coherent, it's illegitimate, it's wrong, and I disagree with it, but I understand the point of view. But that point of view, to my mind, is invalidated and becomes incoherent and unjust when you say that it is only going to be applied to people who contract debilitating and incurable diseases. Because then you are talking about the epitome of double jeopardy. You are talking about people who have the misfortune to become ill, and not only that they will suffer the pain and worry of that, but also they will be forced to fund for their own care to the point of uh, losing their savings and becoming much poorer for them and their families than they would otherwise be. And that seems to me to be an outrageous suggestion, and that was what lay behind the indication of that audience in that room. Mr Speaker, this is why, because we don't know which of us are going to fall ill and which of us are going to remain healthy, this is why every civilised society turns for answers to the concept of social insurance, where we all pay in in the hope that we will not need to draw down on the policy, but the expectation that if we need to, that care will be there and we won't have to pay for it ourselves by becoming poor. That is the principle that must underpin any review that goes forward on social care funding in this country. And people will throw their hands up aghast at the potential cost of this, Mr Speaker. But in Scotland, the Scottish SNP government, with support from other parties, has maintained for 10 years free personal care for the elderly, which, uh, which provides a service for 77,000 older people in Scotland. To do that across the UK would perhaps cost £7 or £8 billion. Pounds. A very large amount of money, Mr Speaker. 1% of our gross national product, and that is the question that presents us as this review continues. Yeah. And imagine that those uh, sitting on the government benches and the new helpers they have in the DUP would normally find Security Day and the Queen's Speech debate part of their natural territory. Uh, but the lack of defence-related issues and either their grubby deal or the Queen's Speech yeah. itself shows how much we have moved away from being uh, what could be called the normal Parliament. From my perspective, as a, and as the newly re-elected MP for Dunfermline and West Fife, this week has been a very proud week indeed, as the largest ship ever built by the Royal Navy, the HMS Queen Elizabeth, left Rosyth in my constituency yeah, yeah, yeah. for the first time 
to begin her sea trials. She is a testament to the skills of the men and women in Rosyth who played a part in their construction. Both the Queen Elizabeth and the Prince of Wales, along with the Goliath tra- train, have become part of the West Fife skyline. And there is also sadness that the Queen Elizabeth will be leaving us. However, I doubt that uh, she will be back very soon indeed to, uh, for adjustments following the sea trials and indeed refits into the future. Yep. Mr. Speaker, in terms of the debate, the carriers are a great way to measure the current state of the MOD, uh, central as they are to the stated aims of the SDSR. This is the capability that will involve deployment of many UK Premier platforms and people. The Type 26 frigates, yep. the Type 45 destroyers, the Asut class submarines, the P-8s, and not to forget the F-35Bs uh, that will fly from the flight deck of the carriers. In the last Parliament, I asked many questions about the composition of the carrier group uh, and the platforms that make it up, something I intend to continue in during this session in Parliament. Yeah. Not that I often, of course, got an answer from the Minister, but uh, the Government have been exceptionally vague on the individual elements of the carrier group and whether they will be able to even deploy both carriers simultaneously. Yeah. The time constraints imposed on me today mean I will not be able to go into all the details around the deployment of carriers. However, I think there are three issues that need to be discussed uh, in future debates. One is the manning levels within the Royal Navy. Secondly, the problems around the F-35B and the Government's ongoing failure to deliver a shipbuilding strategy. Yeah. Firstly, on the issue of manning, uh, as in the, the NHS, uh, a 1 per cent pay deal or pay cap is having a detrimental effect on the uh, ability of the services to uh, keep the personnel that they need uh, in post. The Royal Marines are already being sacrificed for this. The submarine service allegedly is 25 per cent short of full man strength, and we can see this is far from being an abstract debate. In terms of the F-35Bs, this is the most expensive military procurement project in the world, and each F-35B plane costs about as much as 10 DUP MP votes in this place. So it is a, a, a great investment uh, from the government's side to make sure that this works. Uh, what I would like to say in conclusion, uh, Mr Speaker, is that the, um, the, for the Type 26 frigates, the, the workers in government need that reassurance that they can continue their work. Yeah, yeah. First it was 13, then it was then reduced down to 8, right. with five 30, Type wow. 31 frigates <coughs> added in. The Parker report failed to inform us that the shipbuilding, shipbuilding strategy would be published and it is, again, something quite different that we have. Yep. So I think the Minister is in the process of announcing three frigates, yep. but we will wait and see how that comes out well, in the next week. I will certainly give way. But is it not incumbent, Mr Speaker, that all of Scotland's elected members of Parliament hold the Government to account on the rollback of that promise of the 13 ships that were supposed to be built on the Clyde and in Scotland. You think so? yeah. here, here. Well, certainly every single member here, here. who represents uh, every yeah, single member and MP who represents the Scottish constituency should be fighting for these ships, fighting for these jobs, and making sure that commitments given in previous years are upheld and, and made sure that Where's they are delivered the upon in full. Here, Mr. Here. Speaker, in conclusion, I'd like to say that uh, I will be fighting my hardest for the, the workforce that reside to make sure as many jobs can, can come to our constituencies as humanly possible. But we cannot forget the workers on the Clyde, the workers elsewhere across Scotland who depend on M- MOD contracts to make sure that uh, we have a fighting force fit for this century. Thank you.